Morning with your kids. Hola, Nihon, Konnichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Bonamuluanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so happy and so very thankful that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show and please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Our guests today are Carmen Agraditi and Brian Lees. They are here to celebrate Wombat Said Come In. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media. Facebook.com slash reading with your kids. At reading with your kids on Instagram and TikTok. At Jedly Magic on Twitter. We have a great Reading With Your Kids Pinterest page. We have a fantastic Reading With Your Kids YouTube channel. And of course, readingwithyourkids.com is our website. If you go there, you can sign up for our free online magazine. You can also use the contact button at the top of the page to tell us what we're doing well, tell us what we could be doing better, and tell us who you would like to hear on a future episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Oh man, I have a feeling this is going to be a fun conversation with two wonderful guests coming to us to celebrate a great new picture book. It's called Wombat Said Come In. First, joining us from Stone Mountain, Georgia, the author Carmen Agra Didi. Hey Carmen, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm wonderful. I'm really excited that you're here. I have a feeling that, that the pre the pre interview was a lot more fun than what we <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> also, we, it was dull. Children, it was very dull. It dull. was. It was. It was. <laughs> also joining us from right outside of Boston in beautiful Duxbury, Massachusetts, the illustrator Brian Lees. Hey, Brian, what's up? Hey, Dreadley. It's so great to be with you here. I'm really excited. Why don't we start by asking Carmen to tell us all about Wombat, Wombat Said Come In. Wow, that's a that's a tall order, my friend. How about if I give you the, the the nickel tour of Wombat's World? Nickel tour sounds good. All right. So uh, every every year there are bushfires in Australia. Some of the children and grownups may remember or not that just before the pandemic, there were some particularly fierce wildfires in Australia. Let me repeat that. Some of the children and adults may remember that. Prior to the pandemic, there were some particularly fierce fires in Australia. After the fires were put out, however, something very strange happened. Now, I say strange in the sense of unusual. I don't know if unprecedented is the right word. It certainly hadn't been observed before that anyone knew. Animals had been uh, allowed to sort of wiggle their way in or crawl in, however, however they did it, into wombats' burrow. Now, wombats are lovely, portly little creatures. So their burrows are pretty big. They're spacious from the entryway all the way through, and they're vast. And so when the fires were out, animals were coming out of wombat burrows, and animal behaviors didn't know what to make of this. Um, so it, it sort of was this little um, news tidbit that showed up lots of places. And one of the things that, and I think Brian will agree with this, he's also a writer, not just an illustrator. He's an incredible illustrator. But he writes, and we're always looking for story ideas. And that just seemed fabulous. Um, what are the odds, right? So, of course, after a while, pandemic, you're stuck at home, and you're a writer. What are you going to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> besides Netflix? You're going to read, and you're going to write. And you're going to cook. But um, I did some writing, and the, I, the whole idea of Wombat at first being, you know, because he, he's sort of a solitary fellow, and the first – creature to come along, you know, he was he was pretty uh, amenable to the idea of them coming in. In fact, there's a little song, you know, come in, come in, my friend, come in. But about the third or fourth guest, and, and they're not always the best guests, and someone mentioned this recently, well, that, that it was curious that some of the, you know, these, these poor animals were not so very well behaved. I have had guests, and I have been a guest. Guests are not always well behaved. 
<laughs> they borrow your slippers. They break your favorite teacup. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes they do dishes, but not often. And so, although I love having guests in my home, I understood poor Wombat that by about the fourth or fifth one, he's had enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, by then the fires are out and he sends them all home. And I don't want to tell you the end because it'll ruin the story. It's my favorite part. And I think Brian, the way he depicted it was inspired. What you find out is although he's pretty cranky towards the end and he sends all these animals home, he can't help having a wombat heart. That's all I'll tell you. That's that's really neat. You know, I can relate to wombat because I also love guests coming over the house. But I love it because I have an idea when they're going to leave. That's right. You know, it's like, I'm like okay, this, is, this isn't this is as great as I thought it was going to be, but it's going to be over in a day or two. It's those those extended, when are they leaving kind of things that, that just... But, but, you know, it's funny you would say that, because in the book, there actually is a spread where Wombat says he's about to tear his little fur out, and he says, well, that's all right. They'll surely all go home soon. And then you turn the page, and it says, Wombat was mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> And Brian did this magnificent two-page spread, and they're eating his marvelous Australian snacks, and they're reading his books, and they're flung over his his you know his divan, and they've they've knocked over the painting of his beloved ancestor. By the way, Brian, I love him. Um, there's the painting of one of Wombat's ancestors. His name is Fair Dinkum. Fair Dinkum. Which is, I know, which is you know. It's just a and joke there. Yeah, a little Australian joke there. You know, that means a really fine fellow. It's fair dinkum. So, Brian, what was your reaction when you first read the manuscript? Well, I I have known Carmen for years and have loved her writing for years and have been have sort of anxiously waiting for a manuscript to come that sort of felt like it really matched the kind of stuff that I love to do. And suddenly there was Wombat. Uh, Wombat came in over the electronic transom in an email. And I, I opened it up and I read it and I thought, yes, this. Oh. Now, the thing is that um, I, I can get enthusiastic about things. I'm, I'm an enthusiast. And so I'll get enthusiastic about things that maybe I shouldn't. But then I, I read it out loud in a parking lot uh, with my wife we were waiting for an appointment to go in somewhere, and I said, what do you think? And she said, yes, you're uh-huh. doing this one. And what I love about this story is that it is such a great read aloud. This is a story that if you are a parent who loves doing silly voices with your kids, you know, to be a, every single one of these characters is written so clearly in a different voice that you can't help but, but come up with your own voices for them. And so, you know, that's something that just makes the whole reading experience so much more delightful. When, when uh, you know, they, oh, Daddy, you're doing that wrong. That's not the right voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, let's do this then, kind of thing. And so it's it was such an obvious manuscript that I had to do. Uh, I just absolutely loved it. Yeah. You, you know, Carmen, that's – Brian brings up a point – I. It's been a couple of decades um, since I was curled up on on a couch or a bed with my daughter and my son reading to them and making those voices and sometimes intentionally, sometimes by mistake, mixing up the voices. And it is, it's it's a lot of fun. And the kids, I think the kids have a lot of fun correcting me. Was that something that was that you were conscious of as you were creating the book saying, oh, I need to make these characters very distinct and very different? Well, you know, when we work with kids and writing, teaching them to write, teachers and then authors who go in, one of the things we talk about is voice. And the more distinct, the more the clearer the voice, the more we have a sense of the character as an individual, not just a one more peg in a cast of, you know, characters that go click, click, click. And I, I have to pause here and say that I, too, had been waiting for years to work with Brian. And, yes, I tried to give these characters very distinct voices so that when you read them, you could almost – intuit how they would speak but you have to look at the illustrations and they are so just out of this world that you look at them and you think oh that's exactly that's exactly how kookaburra would speak or that that's exactly how platypus would speak oh wombat hot hot the heatness the hotness of it all oh 
you just have this sense of she's just this exuberant, kind of wonderful, marvelous, glorious complainer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and as an illustrator, I think one of the things is that um, there, are, there are times, I mean, I, I write a lot of my own stories, but uh, Deuce occasionally illustrate other, other people's when it's absolutely right. And um, getting a manuscript where you have such distinctive voices really makes it an easy job because, as Carmen just said, you do have this strong sense of who this is. And just the voice alone can can really sort of um, indicate a lot of the things that you're going to want to show as the illustrator, how the character moves, you know, is is the character wearing anything or not? In this case, they aren't. But um, you know, how how do they move? And you know, it, it just it it makes your job it's that better. much easier. I interrupted you, and I'm sorry because I got enthusiastic. Um, Sugar glider, <laughs> but you did with him. I just he's all movement. He is all movement, and that's the whole point. By the way, um, I will confess here, and I think Brian will go. Oh, of course, Sugar Glider is a preschooler. Absolutely, yes. All it, it, all enthusiasm. Oh, yes. And movement and touchy, touchy, pokey, pokey. Yep. <laughs> exactly. No executive functioning. <laughs> Brian, you, you've been, uh, you, you're going to be doing one of our Drawing With Your Kids lessons, and I'm really excited that kids are going to be able to, to see that and learn how to draw a wombat. I'm always fascinated at illustrations that, that you can feel the movement. You just look at the picture, and even though it's a, a still three-dimensional picture, you can almost feel the wind uh, going through your own hair as you, as you as you look. Is is there a, a, a key, a secret to creating that kind of feeling? I, I guess I would say um, that probably the the key is imagination. And that you have to understand what the feeling is like in three dimensions in your own life in order to be able to try to translate that onto the page. I know that a lot of animators have mirrors. And they'll stand up in front of it and they'll make faces and they'll do the physical gestures. And when I'm illustrating a character in movement, I am. there are times where I will actually get up and take photographs of myself in that position. But most of the time, it's really up in the head. It's about trying to imagine where the weight is. What, you know, what part is attached to the ground? What part is flowing? Where are the arms going? And somehow all that stuff working together, if you're doing it right, does give you a feeling of, of movement. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not an easy thing to do. I think it's obvious, it, much easier to draw a character that looks static as though mm -hmm. it's just sort of standing. It's, that are sort of weighed into the ground. But, you know, I want to I want to try when I can to make something feel like it's truly moving without doing cartoony swoop lines mm -hmm. or anything like that to show this character is moving right now. Don't you see that? Because here are the lines that show this. Hey, Carmen, well, I, I, and what Brian is funny because another thing that he does really wonderfully, I just I think just exceptionally, is perspective. You might see the characters dead on, but you might see them from above. You might see them from an angle. You might see them from the ground looking up. And so you also have a sense that the world is very different than what you are looking at. That little world has lots of different perspectives. And because we don't know what it's like to live inside a burrow with a wombat, <laughs> at least not most of us, um, I think that added perspective also gives it a certain magic. Yeah. And I think that added perspective is a great key to for us to start a conversation with our kids to just help them realize that people look at the world from different perspectives. And that's mm -hmm. a, I think mm -hmm. that's a really valuable lesson. And I, and I, I don't think it's, we can teach our kids that too early. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Hey, Carmen, were you like me? And when Brian was talking about standing in front of a mirror, making faces or taking pictures of himself, I, I was just thinking of, of, of Brian's neighbor during the middle of the pandemic, looking through his window, <laughs> seeing this guy making all these gestures and faces and thinking, oh, my goodness, he's, he's given into the virus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that I actually go out onto the front lawn to do this, <laughs> which makes that much more likely. But uh... <laughs> oh, 
But it does it does help to have a sense in your own body what the character has mm -hmm. is going in their body too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you know, one of the things, Carmen, that you were mentioning is that you love this sort of like little inside joke that that picture. Uh, and, and the fun name that Brian gave the, the ancestor of the wombat. And uh, do you think about that stuff when you're writing? Are, are, are there things that you yeah. write that, that parents are going to get that kids might not necessarily get? When my girls were growing up, and probably your, your children as well, Sesame Street was what you sat and you watched with them and you folded laundry or whatever. And part of the reason you could tolerate things that were being geared at a developmental age as was between, you know, like three and five or four was because they kept throwing out these wonderful references to things that were in the grown up world that you knew the children didn't get, but you did. And you were so amused by them. But the beauty of it was, this is what I think about children's books, putting things in that they won't necessarily understand contextually. You know, they haven't read the Iliad or whatever, or they don't know about, uh, you know, the golden ratio. It's something that Brian has used in another book. Um, I actually, to me, that's so exquisite because, see, children, you feed them, they grow. Mm -hmm. And one day, they grow up, and they keep going back to these books, and then they read them, they go, oh, get out. Is that really, <laughs> was that in there? So a great picture book to me grows with the child. It isn't just written for the child at that particular age. And so this book, I'm so glad you asked this question because I was going to mention something about, I hope that the children see how much work was put into it collectively. I mean, as a writer, editor, illustrator, art director, into curating this book. So if you see the end papers, that was all Brian there. Um, you see little footprints heading towards a welcome mat. And if you look at the footprints closely, you could look them up online and you could identify the animals. Now, in the back of the book, the end papers do the opposite. You see them running away from the welcome mat. Uh, when the jacket comes off, because at some point a jacket on a book gets torn or pulled off, or you suddenly realize, wait, there's something on there. Why, in fact, there is. There's a surprise. All of this, there's, there's a cut, what you said, is it cutaway, Brian? What's the word I'm thinking of? Yeah, cutaway of Wombat's Burrow. Of side. Wombat's Burrow. Yeah, and it has all the different rooms and the things you would have in it. And then I wrote a, uh, a, a sort of a tour of false with some wonderful uh, Wombat facts. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian and I did a tremendous amount of research. Brian, for his illustrations, I just think went all out, just I, I, there are so many lovely Australian references and we were just at a school and we had the best compliment. I'm going to say it because I'm going to embarrass Brian. Um, there was a woman there and hopefully she meant it for both of us, but I think it was really intended more for Brian that being an Aussie, she could say that this book was so completely, utterly just familiar to her uh, and that it wasn't a false note um, culturally. Oh, that is because wonderful. I know. It's one of the things is, you know, as, as an American doing a book with Australian animals, um, you can so easily fall into stereotypes of things. You're like, oh, there's shrimp on the bobby, you know, right. and that and that stuff. And I didn't want to do that. So there are a lot of little sly references. Mm -hmm. And as, as Carmen said, I think I think one of the things about doing some of the references for the grown ups is that the the value in that is that the grown-ups love reading the book along with the kids. Mm -hmm. And so that helps to cement the love of reading in the kids, because this is not then a book that the grown-ups like, oh, Lord, slip that one down behind oh, the sofa. Yeah. I don't <laughs> want to read that one again. If, you know, if the grown-ups are invested in the story, if they enjoy it, um, then the whole reading experience between child and parent is that much closer and it's almost blackmail in some ways. You're tying parental love in with reading. And all that does is it cements the love of reading with kids. Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely. And it's sort of like parent entrapment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, want to, we want them to go in not knowing that we've actually set the trap for them. Uh -huh. uh, that hopefully, anyway, that they'll be having so much fun, whether it's making the voices or, or really in, uh, going through, I mean, I, inspecting is the right word, but I think inspecting the illustrations, really going in and seeing the little things that are 
illustrators call them Easter eggs, mm-hmm. but the little things that are hidden in there that uh, they might miss. And it was so fun. Brian, I, you know, you know this. I just, I, lo- I loved, loved working on this book, working with Brian. Total, total love fest because I so loved working <laughs> on the text. I mean, <laughs> Well, I, I want to ask both of you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, and I, and I don't think it would be, but one of the things that, that we've explored here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, I, I said to my wife who just retired as a teacher after teaching in the Boston Public Schools for 34 years, and her one of her best friends who is principal in the same system, when we first launched the podcast back 2017, 2018, I said... Uh, how can we get, you know, I know the parents who love reading, who love books, they're, they're going to tune into this. But a lot of the inner city parents that you're dealing with may not be listening to this. How can we reach them? And both my wife and her friend said, you know, Jedley, a lot of our parents are working three jobs. They might right. not be able to speak English. A lot of our parents don't read. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to find ways, and we've been talking to different experts about ways that a parent who's not comfortable reading can still pass on that love of reading to their kids while they're hopefully becoming more literate themselves. How do you imagine, what kind of ways can that parent take Wombat said come in? And even though they're not able to read all of the words, what kind of conversations can they have? How can they experience this book in a way that's fun for them and for their kids? Call me, call me, call me, call me. Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, you know, grew up in a second language. Um, it, growing up, you know, learning a second language. Let me start that again. I grew up in a home where my parents' English was cursory. And they spoke Spanish. Um, and they learned English, but it was, it was uh, a labor mm-hmm. of love and of, of, well, they were dutiful about it, but it was very hard, particularly for my mom. She never completely grasped English. And I love picture books. I mean, this is such a great question. Picture books are a, to me, they're the gateway to reading, especially for, um, I'm also dyslexic, um, and grew up really poor. So there are all those markers, right? When, couple of things. This book is a lap book. Not completely. A lap book usually means that it is sort of horizontal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a nice big size that can be open onto two laps. So there's that sort of, that intimacy that happens when you're reading. But the other thing is, you could go through this book at the looking at the illustrations only before that you read it. And maybe the child reads it to the parent. And you could guess what is happening all the way to the end without ever reading a word of text. And you could even have the parent tell the child what they think is happening. And then the child could read it to the parent. One of the best places to learn English, and I do this, I, I, I go to a lot of um, Spanish-speaking communities, and I say, you want to learn English? Sit down and have your child read you a picture book and follow with your finger as they read. Have them put their finger on the words and then follow, not your finger, their finger. Let them touch each word as they say it, because you're also going to have visual support. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the words, but you're also looking at the pictures and you're seeing the, the black crow, or you're seeing the, the engine that could and the mountain. And so to me, you want to get parents excited about reading, have them read picture books. You know, there are high schools where they do in English class, there's a whole unit on reading picture books and that's where many of the challenged readers, the readers that have the toughest time, flourish. Mm-hmm. Because now they're, they're understanding, they're, it's at their, you know, sometimes it's closer to their reading level. Mm-hmm. And they have these illustrations that if they're confused, they can reference them. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. It's oh, very lengthy. No, no, it absolutely makes sense. And it reminds me, we've had a guest on the show, Malcolm Mitchell, who brought a lot of joy to Brian and I as a member of the New England Patriots winning the Super Bowl a number of years ago. He arrived in college and realized in a class when other kids were being asked to stand up and read, he realized at that time that he wasn't a reader. Mm, and wow. he went and used picture books to teach himself how to read. And now he is writing books and he's a phenomenal advocate for literacy. Um, in addition to being a Super Bowl champion. Oh my goodness. How many lives does he have? I know. That's fabulous. I know. Brian, I know. you have to say about this. What do you think? Well, I mean, 
think I, I love the, the thing is I, that you know what Carmen is describing is really sort of the the reverse of um, a family that that has the tradition of reading um, how you teach the child. And I think it, any time that you can make the experience of encountering a book joyful, however you encounter it, um, that is where the, the, that root of loving reading comes from. I mean, a, you know, a picture book, they, people often say that you should be able to simply look at the pictures and understand the story, simply read the words and understand the story. But when you get the two of them together, there's oh. a crescendo that mm-hmm. takes the, the whole thing and turns it into a, a tsunami that's so much better. And, the, you know, the, the key, I think, of, of, of literacy is enjoying the words and enjoying the experience of sitting with words on paper and what they do in our brains, how they make movies, how they, they, how they make us laugh, how they make us cry. You know, the, the, to to actually have an emotional experience with words on paper, and until you work at it, you don't get that. It doesn't it doesn't magically happen. You don't just sort of sit down one day and say, "Boom, I'm a reader." So so, however we try to do it, it's it's a um, an effort that's really really worth doing, because it's it's like um, somebody discovering the color red who's never seen red before. How do you, you know, how do you say to somebody who's never seen red, this is, you ha- you don't understand how amazing this is. But I think that reading stories is like that, that, that the people who don't have that habit, um, they don't care because they haven't had that magical heart experience of being transported somewhere different. So I'm, I'm rambling a bit here, but it's, it's the, to me, it's, it's such a vital part of life to be able to experience text and pictures and to experience other lives that you're never going to meet. You know, See, books. Readers, but we're, and that's why you know that. That's why I know it, but yeah. we don't, we weren't born readers. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people are, their minds are the way they are literally neurologically wired. They process language more easily than others. Exactly. But isn't that way. Mm-hmm. I probably stories that way Mm -hmm. i couldn't eat enough of them like potato chips words were very difficult but when you fight that particular dragon and win and you have saint george's sword and that is you know when finally comprehension kicks in and fluency when that happens every story in the world and every life from every corner of the planet is open to you when children i you know and i really think that has to happen young i had this theory. I mean, I, you know, anybody an idiot can have a theory. And so this idiot has one. Guys, you want to hear? Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I I think the studies do bear this out. But um, when it comes to reading in particular, a child's mind is like, like, like wet clay. Any impression, like a handprint, once it dries, it's there forever. If a young child can acquire not just the practice of learn to read, in other words, the practice of it, but acquire a love of reading, I think that also cements itself. Mm-hmm. And in speaking to a group of adults, usually it's, you know, um, reading recovery groups or reading groups, I'll say, how many of you remember a picture book from childhood? Now, if I ask the two of you, do you remember your favorite picture book? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Tell me. Mis- Mr. Bear Goes to Boston by a gentleman named Myron. I think it's Myron French. Bingo. All right, Brian. Uh, uh, Miss Susie, illustrated by Arnold Lobel and uh, written by Miriam. Yeah. And the book is three feet to my right. <laughs> I still have my childhood copy. All right. Charlotte's Web, E.B. White. Mm-hmm. How about that? And here's what you guys don't, well, you certainly, the listeners won't see. You all are both smiling. When I ask the question to 200 adults in an auditorium or a thousand, the funny thing is they all start to smile when you say, when I'm going to count to three and just say the name quietly of your favorite book. And you sweep, you you know, the the sweeping glance across that, that, that group of people. And suddenly these 
very serious adults who have, up to now have been, you know, very sort of mm. imposed even a little stern because it's a serious business, this literacy thing that we're doing. And yeah. now we go to the bits and bobs of it, the little the little pieces, which is the beginning, the very beginning, when you're very young and you find that book like Pokey Little Puppy. I had a superintendent come up to me and go, you know what I love? And he's looking over his shoulder like his people are behind him and they're going to like drag him out, right? <laughs> he goes, I love Pokey Little Puppy. I know it wasn't literature, but I loved Pokey Little Puppy. And I think, how beautiful was that? Yeah. So that's scary. That is my theory, that if we get them young and the right book gets to them, they're ours. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like language acquisition, mm-hmm. that, if, that they say that if you don't get to somebody and it's, I, I, Third grade. It's here it might be younger uh, for, for reading, but you know, but by the time you're 12 or 13, you will never become a, 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 a natural speaker of a different language. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to think that you can catch a 14-year-old a uh, sixteen-year-old and and inflame them with the love of reading because they just never had the right book. But I'm not sure. I don't. I honestly don't know what the the literature is on that. Well, what they're saying is at third grade that mm-hmm. that's the, if, they, if they're not reading, if they're not strong readers by third grade, it's very hard. But mm-hmm. you know what? I love anything that breaks a rule. Mm-hmm. And my dad learned to read when he was fourteen because he grew up during the Depression in Cuba. And it's a long story I won't tell you now, but I will tell you, he couldn't do it. He tried and he tried, and a baker taught him to read using a comic strip that had come from the U.S. It was called El Principe Valiente, Prince Valiant. Oh, yes. Uh... It had. <laughs> yes, it had words, it had text, and it had illustrations. Yeah. 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 I, mm. I was a fan of Prince Valiant myself, and... Um... Uh... Yes, yes. So I, I want to challenge everybody who's listening out there. I, I, I somehow want to make this a, a, one of our mission. Our mission is to help all families grow closer through reading. If there is a literacy program in your community, please go out and support it. Well, let's, let's give all the help we can to families out there, uh, especially with parents who are struggling to read. Give them the support they need so they can help instill a love of reading with their kids. And we all know the many benefits that that kids get from becoming readers and falling in love with reading. And we all know the benefits that our society gets having readers. Um, it just makes the world a better place. It does. Carmen, where can we go to find out more about you and find out more about your great books? Oh, you can go to my website, carmenagraditi.com. And it's C-A-R-M-E-N-A-G-R-A-D-E-E-D-Y. Um, and if you just can't find it, just put Carmen Didi and search and put website and it'll come up. Awesome. Brian, where can we go to find your website? Uh, similarly, it's my name. It's uh, www.brianlees.com. And Lees is spelled like lies, L-I-E-S. All right. We've had a great time, a really great time speaking to the author and illustrator of Wombat Said Come In. It's really appropriate because Wombat was such a a beautiful, loving, kind host. And we've had just this wonderful, warm, we're all hanging out in in the Reedville living room here with our guests, uh, Carmen Agraditi and Brian Lees. My friends, thank you so much for being with us. Thank oh, you're you. very welcome. It was a real I'll pleasure. Be- Thanks for having us on. Mm-hmm. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Frances Schoonmaker. She'll be here to celebrate her new middle grade novel, You Don't Want to Miss It. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we're going to start by thanking our guests, Carmen Agra Didi and Brian Lees. Please be sure to check out Wombat Said Come In. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Skylar Strauss, Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. But most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.